viewers of the Civic Space TV, friends of the Youth Roundtable, welcome to yet another episode of the Youth Roundtable. Like I always do, I give a brief historical background onto our today's conversation. The third national development plan of Uganda encourages or champions the need to bring services closer to the people of Uganda, and we believe that the national resistant movement in their sixth term saw it prudent to introduce the parish development model. This is a model that we shall be able to understand in today's conversation but we also know that this is just like any other government program that the National Resistance Movement has endeavoured to, to bring across in the aspect of eradicating poverty. We have seen Emioga, we have seen Bonava Gagawale and so many others. So we are here to evaluate what difference does the parish development model bring towards the transformation of Uganda's economy. Many have said that Uganda is largely subsistent. So is this the bullet? sorry, the silver bullet that will bring our economy up to the middle income status. And to enable us to appreciate this conversation, I'm joined by a panel of three gentlemen and a single lady that I now take the singular opportunity to introduce. Right from my extreme left is uh, a comrade and friend of mine, Mr. Nabuyanda Solomon. Solomon is a former, a former contestant for the Eastern Youth Member of Parliament. I also know that he's a human rights defender but also a member of the Forum for Democratic Change Youth Wing. Solomon, you're most welcome. Um, thank you so much. Do you want to say hello to our viewers? Um, I sh it's imperative and important that I should note. Um, I'm so humbled and privileged to share in this uh, Youth Roundtable and Civic Space as we expound more on issues of national importance from all angles. And I'm happy that at least on the panel, um, uh, I can see um, open-minded and objective minds, and I'm expectant. Thank you so much, oh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Next to Mr. Solomon is uh, my boss at the National <laughs> Youth Council by the name of uh, Sam Ogwa. <laughs> Sam Ogwa comes all the way from Aleptom district, but also is the Secretary for Finance of the National Youth Council of Uganda. Sam, you're most welcome. Our viewers would love to listen to your voice. Thank you very much, Moses. And uh, first of all, happy birthday. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's good that today we are celebrating your birthday and also hosting me in your panel on this special day of yours. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, I also want to say hello to my colleagues and my brother. Uh, Moses, uh, the issue today that we are going to discuss is very objective. And also, I love the fact that we are going to look at the perspective of the young people into this renowned and um, I talked about program, the parish development model. Otherwise, thank you for the opportunity. I uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Being a ladies' month, I will come to the ladies last. Let me come to <laughs> Comrade uh, Lawel. Lawel Muhezi is uh, a legal scholar at Macquarie University. I also know that he's a member of the Now Generation Uganda. Lawel is the second time on the Youth Roundtable, and so we are happy to have you. Yes, um, again, uh, my name is Muhoizi Joshua Lawel. I'm a, a legal scholar, like you have said, and a member of the Now Generation platform. I'm happy to be back on this platform. Uh, I look forward to a better and a good discussion. Sure, thank you very much for sparing the time. Last, uh, yes, last, of course, on the panel is uh, my good friend Namakanda Christine. Christine comes all the way from the ghetto and um, she is a ghetto youth leader and uh, she is a very important panelist in today's conversation because um, we don't want to make this completely an elite conversation. Let's hear voices from the people down there in the ghetto and let us know what they think about these government programs. Have they actually helped them? And that is why I think um, Comrade Christine joins us here for the first time. Christine, you're most welcome. Thank you very much, yeah. Comrade. Um, as he has introduced me, I'm the Makanda question from the ghetto. I think uh, this conversation is going to be very important. It has not segregated, it has not looked at the political affiliations. It has all favored all the youth who are in this country. And I'm hoping forward for a positive position in this place. Thank you very much. In ghetto, we love this program. And I think it will be equally important that when I come from this place, I go back to the ghetto, the youth will be happy about it because it's all about their yearning for and it's all about the low class person. 
And since it's all about that, they are already there and they are ready to work together. And I'm happy that, comrade, you have done this for us. We never thought it can be there. Thank you very much. I remember my coming. Yeah, thank you. You're, you're most welcome. And uh, you see, like I said, you're very important on this panel because your views are actually quite very pertinent towards this conversation because at least you're at the grassroots level. So you, are, you deal with the day-to-day -day, you know, activities and challenges of, of young people. And the Youth Roundtable is uh, very intentional about uh, taking these conversations to the lowest level. So we appreciate you sparing the time. Uh, Comrade Sam, I'm going to begin with you straight away. I, I know that for sure the National Youth Council has endeavored to take the institution equally to the grassroots by you know, having community conversations. But let us first begin with the parish development model. You're the Secretary for Finance to the National Youth Council. And the parish development model has a very strong financial element attached to it because the idea, well, at the start, this, the, the, the NRM proposed 100 million per, to, to be given per parish. Is that per financial year or per quarter? I think per financial year. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then on the launch, we saw it was 17 million Uganda shillings still being given out to every, given out to every parish. So you could just kick us off with a background of the parish development model and how does Uganda find itself last year, last month rather, launching this program and what it means for the young people? Mm, thank you very much, Moses. Um, the parish development model, as the name sounds, mm. is um, supposed to, to take services to the young people, to take services to the community at the parish level. When you look at the, the level of planning, of government. Uh, for the past previous years, mm. government has been planning starting at the sub-county sub level. That's why you will find the, the health center three and all these, these administrative units and services. Mm. But um, I think uh, with the analysis, they found out that um, the services were not adequately reaching to the young people. And the, the intention of, uh, of site services were also not being fulfilled and the goals. So government decided to come up with a new initiatives of taking services back to the people at the lowest level, which is near to the villages. And that's where now the parish development model conversation started. Uh, the parish development model has uh, a total of seven pillars. But of course, people are not talking about other pillars. People are only focusing on where the money is, yeah. and that is the, the hundred million per parish. Uh, but we have the the first pillar is called the production and processing and marketing. Yes. Uh, this is entirely targeting the value addition. Huh? We know that Uganda, when it looked into the area of value addition, we are doing badly. Mm. We mostly export raw products instead of adding value. Even when you go to the village, you find our parents after uprooting their ginats or, or harvesting their maize, instead of turning them into another, some sort of uh, products, mm -hmm. they just sell it the way it is. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, it, it doesn't yield a lot of uh, profit. And uh, also, it, it's not aligned to what the, the country want, whereby they want everyone to move away from the subsistence of production to commercial production. So uh, that's the first pillar. It's supposed to address that. Mm. You have invested your product, agricultural products, or any kind of farm inputs, and then after that, you are supposed to, to, to improve it, and then government help you to identify the available markets, mm. support you to process it, and so that you add value to your product and again get more profit. Mm. And then uh, the second pillar is dealing with the infrastructures and economic and economic services. Mm. Of course, you know that we have the roads, in the infrastructure, the roads, the schools, and and the rest of the things mm. that support economic activity, the marketers, the, the market, the, lo the local markets, community markets. Mm. You know, we all come from villages where every, at least in a month, mm. you find uh, people are going to the market the to market. sell their products and all that. So that's the target, the second pillar. They're supposed to do that to support. Government is coming in to say that, okay, if we have the community market here, mm. or the roads that can lead to the access of the market where our, our people are supposed to, to sell this product to, uh, they cannot access it. So we need to work on it. And the planning now, instead of starting from the sub-county level, 
they are now going to start with the parish level, which the community, the villages can come together and say, well, let's work on this, and government comes in within the parish development model to intervene. Mm -hmm. And of course, the third pillar is the highly talked about, the financial, financial inclusion, inclusion. Mm -hmm. of which, of course, government intend to give around um, 100 million per parish, and uh, we have around uh, 10,594 parishes in, uh, in the country, so we are literally talking about one trillion being injected in a financial year to, to the various parishes uh, in the country. But of course, um, the way this money comes is that it's released in a quarterly basis, and of course, the young people, people like us and our colleagues, which must play a very key role, in uh, mobilizing them is that to benefit to 30 percent. The women have also been given 30 percent of this allocation. The person with disability are also being, people with disabilities are also being given 30 percent. Uh, no, the people with disabilities have been given 10 percent and uh, older person they're also benefiting 10 percent. And the 20 percent is going to the men Mm. who are supposed to be in charge because, you know, research shows that men are a little bit capable of undertaking other various economic Co activities activity. besides agriculture. Mm. So uh, that's the, the, the third pillar. Mm. Of course, maybe we shall dig into deep to talk about how is this money going to, what do the young people need to do to access it and all that. And then when you look at the first pillar, it talks about... Um, uh, it talks about social services, I talked about schools, I talked about uh, the, the, the health Hospital. centers. At the parish level, we have the health center too. But this health center too, they're supposed to do the basic mm. health services eh, to the community, which is not enough. So government looking at how can we improve on mm. the services regarding the health center too and administrative unit within that, within the same areas. And I, the, 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 the fifth pillar, which of course where we come in as a council, and also with the ministry where we belong in, is the mindset change, hmm? the issue of mindset change and community mobilization. Uh, mindset change will be handled by the ministry of gender entirely uh, to, to educate the young people, to educate the community on what is in the program and what they should expect hmm, from the program and what they should do hmm, when they have access to services within the program. So uh, that will be the role of Minister of Gender. And as young people, as I said, we have been given 30% uh, allocation out of the 100 million, which means that each parish, the youth are going to benefit around 30 million Ugandan shilling, of which even to some extent is going to be more because when you look at the statistics, uh, the majority of our colleagues, the, 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 the young girls, the 15, the mothers, they, they range from the, uh, the majority of them are, with, are within the age bracket of 15 mm. to 30. So which means that our our colleagues who are who the are youth, youth who are, also and uh, are also women mm. will also benefit. So literally, the young people are going to get like around 60%, mm. though the advantage is onto the side of the girl child, which I, I, ex I expect my sister here, mm. when after this discussion, is going to, to take a deeper insight about it to mobilize the colleagues and, and to support the program. But also, um, when you... Look at the last pillar, the remaining two pillars. That's the pillars that talks about uh, parish management information system. Mm. And then uh, I think the governance and accountability, yes. uh, which are being handled by the Ministry of ICT and, uh, and the Ministry of Local Government, where the Parish Development Secretariat is, uh, is that um, they're trying to have now the real data mm. Mm, of development at the parish level. Okay. And this will be a real-time information that will be managed by the Ministry of ICT. Mm. Yeah, so basically that is the parish development model and some of the, the things that are within the programs. Uh, maybe for now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, fair enough. I, I gave you enough time so that you can give us the, the entire background of this um, uh, particular agenda. Lowell, let me come to you. Comrade Sam belongs to the National Resistance <laughs> Movement. And I would understand if he tries to persuade the, the viewers to make them appreciate and see the value in, mm -hmm. value in the parish development model. And I think he has done a good job. No, but let me come to you. He says that the youth will get 30%. Um, the women will have 30%. Isn't the NRAM doing something that is worthy saying thank you to? Because, yes, <laughs> I, I am not sure of your political affiliation now, but I know that you were... The, the speaker of the Uganda Young Democrats, which is um, a youth wing of the Democratic Party. 
So yeah. do you think the parish development model could be seen as um, a silver bullet towards transforming <coughs> Uganda's economy? Or do you think that it is going to be, um, I don't have to be pessimistic, but going to be like uh, the Bonabagagawales and the Emiogas, who, whose, whose track record really is one that leaves Ugandans wanting. So what's your own view? Um, last, I think a few weeks ago in Arusha and we had a particular debate about how the youth don't benefit from uh, the economic federation, the, the free trade area, the, the, the relief on trade tariffs, ETC, because mm. they literally have nothing to move across the border. Yes. And therefore they were suggesting that if we could give you know, finances to the youth to mm. be able to boost their businesses. Uh, but after that discussion, we, we had a, you know, a, a, an informal talk, and uh, one had a joke that I think that the economists, the Ugandan government employees, somehow all went to the wrong institutions. Because Uganda is the perfect example in the world where the idea of just giving money to the people to boost eco the economy has totally failed. Because we have had all these phases, like you talked about the Mioga, Abonaba Gagawale, all of these things have failed because the model is, is very flawed and it does not take into consideration that, that, that you know, it is not economically sustainable. Mm -hmm. the, that, that, that model can, the, the model where you have to give money to people to boost, perhaps the, give them capital, mm -hmm. only works in the short run. For example, if, if there is like a, a, an economic emergency where, for example, COVID and you're giving them relief. Mm. Uh, in countries where they are giving stimulus packages, so they just give them the money to mm. take them through that period. But that model itself is not sustainable as an economic alternative. First, look at, look at the case of Uganda. More than 50% of the startups don't meet their first birthday, mm. right? So one can argue that all those individuals who start up those businesses have capital. And, but they don't meet their first birthday. So the problem is not the lack of capital. Mm -hmm. It is the business world, the economic environment in which they exist. Mm -hmm. And if that, those issues then are not dealt with, yeah. then you guarantee that even if you get this 70 million yes. and take it to parishes, even in the best case scenario where they get the money, because sometimes they don't, and they manage uh, to start these businesses, you're guaranteed that maybe 40% of those are not going to sustain a year or even five years, right? So I think we, we, this does not deal with the exact challenge. But the, the, uh, one of the senior policy, policy, policy analysts in this country called God Batumushabe has an argument that if a policy, as, as good as it sounds, cannot be implemented, then that's a bad policy. So we have had all these, all these uh, you know, all these uh, projects, and, and they look very good on paper, right? They, they, they talk about how they're going to bring uh, these these fertilizers are going to bring uh, these these breeds of crops and anim and animals to you know to boost the quality of agriculture, but they, they never get to work because I think we never the problems are not also just with the model they are with, with the implementation strategy and the character of those who implement the idea that you, you have a few individuals being able to benefit from these the people who control the resources somehow I think because of corruption mm. the, the, the people do not. Uh, do not get to um, to get them. I think I, uh, my interaction with the parish development model, I have not seen where there is a very essential difference on how they make sure that you know people get to receive this money. Yeah. Uh, there is nothing very structurally divorced from other prior projects yeah. that would convince me as a Ugandan that indeed this money is not going to be uh, taken before it reaches at the sub county, before it reaches, you know, the parish ETC. So we still also have the implementation challenges, the, the idea of transparency and, and, and these individuals, the common Uganda and being able to benefit. But even if we're, all those things were out of the way, can 17 million or even, I don't know, because I know about 17 million, I don't know if the 100 still stand. I do not see how it is able to transform the, the economic capacity of a parish. I think it is is little money, but that, that should not even be the discussion. I think the entire, the entire project, the model is flawed. Yeah. What needs to be understood is how do we have a robust system uh, that, that, that changes our economic environment where individuals are able to you know, operate and get profit? Because like I've said, the problem is not just capital. Mm. Because even those who have capital do not meet 50%, don't meet their first birthday. But it's the economic environment. Yes, yes. But secondly, the, 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 this, this, this money they are going to waste in, 
in attitude change. Now, as as someone who has studied some bit of psychology, human behavior, mm. I know for sure that you don't uh, go changing society's attitude through uh, conferences and speeches. Mm. It should be part of of our pilot, uh, political mm. philosophy as a country. Mm. You you have interacted with with. This, the Tanzania, the, the, the level of patriotism, ETC, yes. the level of love for government, police projects and policies. These things must be within the political philosophy of the country. Mm. They must be within our everyday interaction in, in our education system, in our classrooms, right? Yeah. So government must be able to inculcate that as, as these Culture people grow in their country. It, mm. You cannot just get money, give it to people to go and talk about on, on radios, ETC. Mm. And, and, well, perhaps there are some pros or cons, but Given the success rate of the other projects, I, I'm very pessimistic. Mm. I don't see anything very, very different. Okay. I should <laughs> Thank you. Fair enough. Uh, uh, Christian, I'll come to you last. Let me go to uh, Comrade Solomon. Solomon, um, you're a legal scholar, or I think a lawyer in the making in the near future. And I know that um, at the foundation of the legal, um, uh, legal school or law school, they teach you something around development studies you know, and how societies are developed and how societies are transformed. I know of scholars like John Locke who have, who have very interesting, you know, um, uh, philosophies around how the economy and how society should be transformed. So my concern to you is our approach as a country, the approach of what Lowell called giving people handouts, you know, giving them money. Are there a, a economies that have developed through such an approach? Let's look at, for example, the UK... Uh, America and those big economies have they developed in such a model, or there are peculiar and significant things that a country must do for it to transform its economy deliberately? Well, um, thank you so much, Chidega. But I should, or oh, it's important for me to note the following. I was so happy and excited when uh, Comrade Lowell brought up the issue of transparency, and I will add one honesty in governance in this country. And it's important for us to acknowledge that um, Uganda is a country that um, assumes we are living under the rule of law. So in the, in the event that we assume we are living under the rule of law, it is so important that whatever we are doing is actually in the interest of the rule of law. When I try to study so much the uh, parish development module, mm. I now come to a conclusion, I now come to realize why um, President Museveni and the ministers have to go to Chibuku to launch the parish development module and not in, 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 in an urban setting. Mm. Literally, it's because they are going to deal with illiterates. They are going to deal with people who are not up to date with what is happening in our country, more so with our economic status quo at the, at, at, at the moment. First and foremost, before we even rush to benchmark in other countries or discuss other countries, um, the bigger question should be, how different is the parish development module from other initiatives that government has implemented? He mentioned um, the pillars, but most of the pillars have been manifested in Operation Wealth Creation, have been manifested in Bonavaga Gawali. But one thing you are going to realize is monopoly of services. Services never get to where they are supposed to go. I love one thing about the NRM chaps is they are very innovative and very brilliant at innovating ideas, but they are failures at implementation. And that is where we find an issue with them. So in developing a country, most especially the economic um, status of our young people and other stakeholders, First and foremost, I think it is so imperative we establish the cause. The cause for the poverty, the cause for the poor health, social services, the cause of the poor, the cause of the poor um, state of affairs in our country today is not because of um, young people lack capital or people lack capital to start up initiatives. Very many have started up. Very many have ideas of starting up. But as Lawila has said, they have not made it to their first birthday. That simply communicates that there is a challenge somewhere in the technical setting. So to me, I think the policy makers, the policy analysts in the various ministries of gender, the Ministry of 
finance and planning, the parliament itself, state house and other state agencies should be capitalizing and spending more time on more time on trying to harmonize, trying to reconcile the technical bit with the, with, with, with the reality. Because I realize as a country we are living in realism, rather in idealism at the cost of realism. Mm. The reality is even the 30 million. When I was reading a statement of a minister 10 months ago in, in, on the floor of parliament to explain about the parish development module, he comes and he says that um, we are going to work with the Minister of Gender, we are going to work with the Minister of Local Government where we shall advertise and the chiefs shall be in charge at the parish development module. So what, happen what happens is politics takes precedence of all organization and technicality is beaten by political, by, 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 by political aspects. That is why you are going to see that matters of accountability, matters of transparency is going to be an issue and is still an issue. Mm. The president, while speaking in Chibuku, acknowledged that corruption is still a challenge, but they are trying to, to, deal, with it. to deal with it. He acknowledges that corruption is still a challenge, but he cannot point out one corrupt. You know what happens is um, when you're cutting a tree, you don't cut the branches. Mm. You uproot it. You uproot it. Mm. And this is not the first time the president is acknowledging, even on the international um, anti-corruption anti -corruption day in Kololo. He says, yes, they are within us, but don't touch them. So with such mentality, with such mentality, it is not a challenge of only the president, but the entire system. Mm. And I agree with Chinua Achebe when he says when things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Yeah, fair enough. That is a, a good point to end your first submission. And Sam, you've, you've heard what our two colleagues are, are, are saying, and I'll give you some time to uh, maybe respond later on, but let me first bring in um, Comrade Christine. Christine, uh, pillar number five is around mindset change, you know. And uh, my question to you, the first is that, what is the mindset status of the ghetto youth? Do they actually see these government initiatives as something that can enable them to transform their lives and not just be mere ghetto youths who live from hand to mouth, but rather do certain sustainable economic activities to transform their lives entirely. But two, your own perspective. Have you benefited from... Um, because whereas these government programs have been there, I'm not sure if my friend uh, Solomon or, um, or Lowell has taken time to go and apply to get these government initiatives and, and loans. I am not sure. Actually, Have you ever on, tried? That on that point... Um, you know, I'm a former youth member of parliament aspirant. Aspirant, yes. Um, I, I've actually applied so many times. But and what I realized is, money? what I realized is, um, if you're not in the system, mm -hmm. you're beaten technically. One of the candidates actually was using it as a technique mm. to collect um, the six of us or five of us in. Which in, program did you apply? I'm, I'm here mm. to go and get cows from from from, from Operation Wealth Creation yes. to better our lives as groups, and they will deny me an opportunity, mm. not as an aspirant or as a white, but as a Ugandan, mm. and give it to an aspirant because so, he's so much connected. So um, the point I left behind was that um, in developing countries or what developed countries did, mm. they developed um they developed incentives that are recognized in the legal baseline studies of their countries mm. which we are lacking in this case fair enough uh let me come back we shouldn't uh leave out the the, the lady i mean this is the lady's math <laughs> so christian <laughs> my question to you have you benefited from any of these government programs but also speak about the mindset of these of, of our ghetto comrades and friends down there it's very true i've heard from my two colleagues they have spoken enough. You know, when you are, when you are in this Uganda, it's you. Mm -hmm. The initiative starts with you. With you, yeah. And if you don't have any responsibility as you, for us in the ghetto to Gama, to a very room, to a very room. To a very room. Okay. If we don't blame the government, mm -hmm. we work for the government. Mm -hmm. Whether which government or what, to a very room. One of the factors that people mistake the ghetto is we are hustlers. I'm a degree holder from Uganda Christian University. I've never applied anywhere. Wow. I don't want to find mistakes in human beings because they are human beings. They have blood and flesh. Mm -hmm. But it does not say people should make mistakes and we watch over them. Mm 
Mm. So for our case in the ghetto, we, we are actively involved in working and we love working. And most of the time, this government in ventures comes in and they bypass us because we're always very busy. Like you had yesterday, you're calling me, I was having something very precious mm. and I don't want it to pass through. Mm. The truth is we lack discipline, financial discipline mm. for us in the ghetto. A few things, even if you bring 10 million shillings or 1 million shillings, we can get it in two to three days. Mm. So we all lo lo look at it as important, but we all, all, always ask ourselves to so get to First is us, me, Christine, what have I done? So that the government can look for me and make that model important. Why, I, why do I say so? We as youths, we are lacking one thing, to start and support the initiative. We are looking for the mistakes outside there. Mm. I have a question. What have you done for any youth? I'm a 32 old year woman with three sons. The father, I don't know where he is, but he's in the world. Mm. The reason why I don't want to look for him is because I don't want to find a mistake in that someone's boy. These children are for both father and mother. Mm. But you'll find a woman in court. She's wasting time, 12 hours in court that is looking for compensation, is raising children. Mm. So I look at that in the side of the youth too. This is a youth who is born of a father and a, ma a mother, put in the world to do what the father has not done. Mm. Have you ever checked what your father has never done or your mother? Do you want to move in the same mistakes? Or we need to polish to make the family become whole again? Mm. In the ghetto, that is the thing. When someone wants to go to school, like I have a, we have a ghetto in Maki, and there's over 900 youths are there. Mm. Those people suffer. And indeed, when we collect, we don't feed them using government money. We collect, we have how many people can afford. We have 20 people who can afford. Can we, we look for the government? No, we first make it, mm. then we look for the government. So what is lacking within us as youths is we want to be started. We want to be told to start. Mm. But I want to tell you today, uh, I have a business that I did not start with a mother. I went to school without a father or a mother. So we need to mature ourselves at the early age. I got matured at the age of 10 years because I knew how to feed myself and look for school fees by myself at the age of 11. So what does this mean? It's not suffering. It's, not, it's, it's growing up with a responsibility that God created you with. So for us, we look at President M7. God gave Solomon wisdom, and we are still using Solomon's wisdom up to now. Mm. It is the same thing is what the president is putting today is he has brought him yoga. What programs keeps on going off and on. Mm. We keep on stepping on the same loopholes that the past youths and the past leaders have done. Mm. So today it is a generation that I'm calling upon that my brothers who are here. That if you want to know that down there people are not seated, you can go to the bus park. I work in the bus park. I work in the garage because my bus goes up to the garage. I walk up to international level, that's Southern Sudan, where poverty is at the highest class. I stay in Southern Sudan for over two weeks or three weeks, whereby a youth, you can even find a youth of 27 year, seven years, is still staying in the father's house. He's still feeding the mother's plate. But today, I am here with my colleague on the right hand and the left, they can speak to the nation and other viewers listen to them putting on a suit and say that we have this and this. The president has done his role. He has brought a model, the way of access. It is we to create the way on how to acquire the money from the government. Reason, the way you can create a way to acquire money, a loan from the bank, mm. I think should be the same way. Because the moment the system is tight and we create it, Mm. Nobody can stand against it unless you, there is a system that is seated on top. Mm. So for Tuewe Ramo Mugeto, we always sell Tuewe Ramo because we, we, we support and we bring into a system that if you're talking to this one and you go and beat this one, we all turn on you. Mm. Because if a system is bad and we have over 30% from the youth in every parish, it is time that we wake up and we say, no, this is our 30%. Let's look for it. Let's look for it. Fair enough. Um, uh, let me come to you, Sam. Sam, our two comrades here 
put an indictment mm -hmm. on the parish development model and they were very pessimistic um, about it. But let me begin from where Comrade Christian stopped, the aspect of how do we get this money? How do we look for the money? And um, pillar number three is about financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. You're the finance secretary to the National Youth Council. And the mandate, I believe, falls on your shoulders to guide young people on how they can access this, 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 this money. I am glad that with, uh, with programs like the Youth Livelihood Program, at least youth knew where to get this money from. I mean, you go to Centenary Bank and all this. But the Parish Development Model looks like it is still you know, a gray area. People don't know where to go. So maybe you could begin with that. Then you respond to the two concerns put across by our comrades. Yeah, uh, I think that's the aspect that uh, I said we are going to dive into. And the good thing is that you have brought it out. And I must advise my brothers, the two brothers, that um, in life, when you look at things from the negative perspective, you will never succeed. Mm. However bad or however bad looking is something is or situation is, look at the positive side. And the positive side is that the initiative is there. Mm. I, I love my sister's submission is that we shouldn't be sitting mm. and just talking. I would love to hear someone talking based of experience that uh, I fail because of the reason A, B, C, D. Not I fail because I judge that it is not going to work. Mm. Yeah. So um, the parish development model, going back to it, is that um, money, first of all, to remove the issue of fear, is that money will be sent directly for the first time in the history of Uganda. That money will be sent directly to the groups at the parish level. From Minister of Finance, Bank of Uganda, direct to the group's account. Direct. No more intermediates to say that you know what, you need to approve my thing. The only role that is there is what we call the parish development committees. This is a committee whereby we are young people also represented. Uh, at council, we have the, the parish youth chairpersons who are, supposed, who are members of these committees. We also have the chairperson of the Women Council, who are also members of these committees. And also we have the committees is chaired by the, the parish chief, mm. the, the, the chairperson LC2 of the parish, because the parish chief is different. And the secretary to the committee is the parish chief. So basically, and most of these people, for me I come from a rural setting, mm, is that at the parish level people know themselves. Mm. Mm. And everyone knows that this is our leader, these are people, members of the committees, and it's easy to access that these groups applied for this, and this is why. And even the leadership at the parish level is very easy to account, and all their leaders, and the people are very easy, it's very easy for them to hold their leaders accountable. Mm. So, literally, the issue of accountability, maybe unless if we are going to blame lack of competence within our parish level, mm. maybe that's the question that we need to, the issue or the question we need to address at this mm. point. But the issue of accountability, this time around, no district is going to have to touch the money or be in charge of approving the groups, the beneficiary. No sub-county will be in charge of that. It's the parish that is going to take charge, of which even the parish, some parish we have in this country, you can walk to the parish headquarter. Hmm? Mm. You can walk and meet, you go to the parish chairperson's what? home and say, how far is our issues going? Mm. Yeah, I think that's to allege that fear. But of course, that's how the money is going to be accessed. Mm. The youth are going to form their groups, how many groups they want to be. Mm. Their package is 30 million. If they need 10 million as a group, they will submit their request to the parish development but committee. Is there a limit? Because if you have 30 million in a parish mm. and one group can apply for 10 million, then mm -hmm. how about the rest? Yeah, Shouldn't uh, there be a ceiling set that a group can only apply for not more than how many 10 youths? million mm -hmm. or, or not more than 2 million, whatever number it is, but there should be a threshold set so that one group Youth can benefit. cannot uh, uh, apply for almost half. And or? that's now something that will be set up by the Parish First Development board. Committee because mm -hmm. they're the ones in charge of disbursing this money. The moment they approve a group, if a group needs 10 million and they find that the project is visible, viable huh? to the community, then they, can, they have no problem that, in giving the money. Some, some, with all due fairness, won't that create um, a gap in terms of what Lawel was saying, the, mm. the, the, the issue of transparency? Mm -hmm. Because if, as a parish 
uh, development committee chairman mm -hmm. it is upon me to decide whether to give group a 10 million or 1 million it then that is too much power that i'm having no it is not the parish development committee chairman yes it is the committee, the committee entire yeah which has the youth represented the women represented the older persons represented in and uh, the parish chief mm. they're all part of this so the decision is not made by the chairman okay it's just like when you sit in a board, a board meeting and i agree that let us perform this specific what task or yes. let us implement this particular activity mm. However, the implementation is a part of the technical, but whenever we have agreed, it's the group decision. Mm. So if a mistake has been made, it's the, not the Paris chairperson mm. eh, that has made, it's a committee. Mm. Now, that's where now they can be, the community can hold them accountable. Mm. And also, you see, it's very easy to govern a small group of people mm. than a larger group of people. Mm. And uh, to that extent, our community, when you go to the rural areas, mm. and maybe different from the urban areas, hmm? mm. but to the rural areas, a parish has around like six villages, six villages having around like um, the total number of population of around uh, 1,000 households or 500 households average. Averagely. Yeah, so literally, hmm, you find that it's it's easy to it manage. It be sufficient. Also, yeah. But also, let's not forget that this money will be given in not only once, Mm. Eh? Given over the financial year, they'll be adding is more it, money to the is parishes. It, is it a revolving fund that I have to pay back? Yeah, it's a revolving fund. But now, how is it going to revolve? Like, let me say, we have a group here, the mm. panel is here, have a group, and we belong to a specific parish A. That parish A has requested for a, for a financial support from the parish development committee mm. to implement a particular project, let me say poultry, mm. or let me say to to to, to add value mm. to, 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 to the maize flour. Automatically, then that parish will be given that money. Mm. But that money, you can either decide to invest it as a team, mm. or you, you decide to handle it on the individual basis, like you as Moses would be interested like, okay, me, I am implementing my poultry mm. at my place, so I am requesting that you give me this. At that point now, is that you need to refund back. So it's still decisive okay. within the parish, within the group. But this money will not be returned back to the government. Okay. And I think this follows the principle that when you go to our rural areas and mostly, you find that, as she said, that groups that are already in existence, mm. they know the word. They even voluntarily are contributing. They're even lending among to themselves. And they're actually getting more, 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 more fun, more okay. money out of their contribution. They're getting more profit out of their lending. So it depends on the approach okay. the group takes. Yeah, uh, thank you. Fair enough. Let me come back to you, Sam, shortly. But um, Comrade Lowell, let me just pick your mind and uh, and Solomon before you go for the break. But um, on the issue of uh, incentives, the issue of incentives is not new. I will tell you that um, Alexander Hamilton, when he was U.S. Secretary of State, introduced the smooth holy tariff. The smooth holy tariff. The idea around it was that how can the American economy be inward looking? Let us impose high taxes on imports, okay? Whereas subsidize or even you know give incentives to the domestic <coughs> local producers, and that is why today we celebrate the Wall Street companies. The government took a deliberate initiative to subsidize and offer incentives, and I think what the government of Uganda is doing isn't very far from what other countries did to <coughs> develop. So my argument is that do you think incentives are exactly because Solomon? Uh, 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 um, criticized the development approach that we're using as a country. But it looks like it has worked in other places. So, the issue of incentives. It is very far different. Um, the, 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 you, when you read about the Japan model, they'll tell you the same. They, 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 um, they prioritize industrialization, but also internal growth of their own companies at the expense of uh, a foreign exchange and you know, by restricting. Uh, the UK itself had the same model. Uh, you read the, around the 18th century, that was the politics around wool, where they, they, they banned the importation of wool. And uh, as also as the industry transformed, they also had those restrictions around clothes, right? Mm. That they, 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 they restricted the importation of clothing uh, to protect their own local industry. 
uh, those things happen, but Uganda has not done the same. And, and, and th 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 those should be the discussion we are supposed to have. And because as he explains the parish development model, the only difference is the idea that it is on parish. But look at the Myoga program, which was the idea that people who are doing the same job, who are involved in the same activity, should be able to group because they have the same challenges as, as a profession or as, as, as a people and they know themselves, they should be able to, uh, you know, best utilize this kind of funding. On the paper, that model, as he explains, it looks good. But again, like I've said, models of, of that character do not work. A younger program right now, if you, if you are to ask for this, the performance indicators, the return, the, the growth, it is not there. One, because one, by the tailored nature of Ugandan systems, but also the model is flawed. I think the discussion we should be having is what do we do differently? Kenya has a policy, I think, where when a, a business starts, they have a holiday for, I think, a period of around four to five years. What that does is protect local, local maybe small-scale businesses. And that is what you talk about, the idea that you, you chase protectionist policies which allow local businesses and startups to flourish at the expense of foreign ones, right? Can we have that, that kind of model here? Can we have that relief? Because also as the debt increases, if you looked at it was the budget framework of, of this year that they're going to base on to pass the July budget, was, was that the, the, the biggest, I think, alternative they have is to increase the URA, the local revenue. That means they have to increase either areas of taxation, widen the tax, tax base, base yeah. or deepen it. Which means, again, the burden comes and falls on the, the local business person, yeah. right? So, so you do not see any intention or deliberate effort to test what you're talking about, the idea that you, you incapacitate local businesses so that they grow and then in the meantime you're able to get taxes, right? What you have here is they are taking capital to people. And like I've already showed, capital is not the problem. Even where people have the capital, they cannot exist. So what it looks like is you give money to these people, they start businesses, but, in, but the national uh, policy is that they increase tax, the taxes, right? Mm. And, 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 and then what? They are taxed out of business. But secondly, and, and to him who, who, who is so much about the youth, what are the youth involved in? Innovation and, um, and, and digital means of production. How much does the innovation fund reach the everyday ghetto child? Rarely do you have guys coming up with help with these bicycles, etc. A lot of innovation in the ghetto. But to what extent and how can a ghetto child access the innovation fund? It's, it's not, there's, it's, so it's, it's rare. Yeah. But second, what I'm saying, can we have for example, the, the idea of, of internet access? You want to transform the youth, you have to make internet accessible, at least in this generation. Can we, can we have, you know, can we have this new tax on internet removed? Mm. You get, I understand that there is, there is this politics of, you know, the youth on the internet making noise. But as a country, when you're planning, at least for the transformation of a country, mm. you must do trade-offs. So you yeah. cannot trade off the incapacitating the economy of the youth at the expense of the, polit of, of the political noise, right? So because the economics works in a form of opportunity cost. Because now you're saving the youth from making noise on Facebook, but then you're depriving the many innovative ones who would rather use the internet. So for a serious government, when they're doing a comparative analysis, mm. they should be able to prioritize access to internet uh, to sustain digital businesses at the expense of the noise, right? Yeah. So, so I or think largely we are not having the right economic discussion. Mm. And like I've said, for the, for the ghetto child, who has not benefited, who, whose economy is really bad, it works for them in the short run. They also get the opportunity to get this money because otherwise it's always eaten by the political heads, the, the people at the, at the top of the economic ladder. So the, only the silver lining here is that the ghetto child somehow feels the money themselves. It comes to them this time. Mm. But is it a sustainable economic policy or plan? I don't think it is. Sure. That is um, a good question to begin with in our second phase. But for now, we take a short commercial break. But as we do so, please feel free to put your comment on the comment section. Please let us know what you think. If you agree with any of the panelists, let us know. And if you disagree, please let us know your alternative opinion about our ongoing conversation. Otherwise, see you shortly after this commercial break. Thank you. Well, well, we'll be back from that commercial break and thank you very much for keeping it on the Youth Roundtable. We hope that you are enjoying this conversation 
And like I had asked you earlier on, please feel free to put your comment on the comment section, but also subscribe to our channel so you can get weekly updates of our notifications. Towards the end, we shall spare some 10, 20 minutes to talk about digital rights in Uganda. But also for now, let's conclude on the issue around the Youth Roundtable. Sorry, the issue around Parish Moment Mode on the Youth Roundtable. And let me begin with um, Comrade Solomon. Solomon, um, uh, to try is not, um, to try and fail is not exactly a crime or not, neither is it bad. So if Bonaba Gagole was tried and failed, if Emyoga was tried and failed, it shouldn't be an indictment on any other, you know, initiative that government comes up with. Yes, it is true, even Ujama, for example, that was brought up by Mualimu Julius Nyerere, had its challenges and it failed. But you saw that eventually um, um, it had a very great impact towards building Tanzania's economy, even with, the, even with its shortcomings. So isn't it rather unfair for us to, to castigate or to put an indictment on the project development model even before it has been um, you know, uh, implemented, even before we have seen what it comes with? Couldn't your judgments be too soon? You know why I've been smiling? I have something inside me telling me the ghost of Idi Amin Dada must be laughing at us as a country. Because as an economic activist, I had you mention the measures that were taken in the world stock market mm. in the days of the 1925 um, World Economic Depression. Yeah. Depression. But you know, all those are reflected in the, in, in, in the age of Idi Amin Dada. What happens is, um, uh, you mentioned the protection policy. Mm. You mentioned so many other incentives. But what you don't mention is, are these countries giving their people money to start up? Mm. As I told you earlier, the challenge is not capital. It is bigger than capital. When you come here, you see, as a historian, I normally refer at the Babon monarchy. Um, uh, during the days, uh, the Babon monarchy, there is, a, there, is a, there, is a, there is a famous quote that says, um, uh, the restored Babons learned something and forgot something from mm. the French Revolution of 1789. So are we as a country. Um, President Museveni's regime, both opposition and government in power, have forgotten something from the previous um, initiatives that have been implemented. Mm. The bigger question is, have we learned something? If we have, what is that? What are the challenges we've had as a country in implementation of those policies? Mm. We don't have that answer as a country. And even, I don't know if the finance secretary here has the answer to, 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 to that question. What are the challenges and what measures have we taken to solve those challenges to assure us that bringing a new program to add it on the existing failed programs, I don't know whether the programs are going to be done away with, but I'm sure they will remain in continuance or in existence mm. and add on another, an, another log on too much we are carrying as a country. We are blundering. Mm. Therefore, I want to make this point. You see, um, I had her make a point that um, she comes from the ghetto. She knows so much about the ghetto people. But at least we've also, some of us have grown up in the ghetto. We've lived in the ghettos. And it is very hard for you, Chidega, or for any elite to, 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 to speak exactly what happens in the ghetto. Just like someone who loses their loved one. It is them that know the experience better than we do. For us, we are just juxtaposing and imagining what they are going through. Mm. So what I, what I want to note here is we could give it a benefit of doubt. Mm. If as a country we entertained a talk such as what have been the failures? How, can, how best can we overcome these failures? These failures. And as well, I want to also add on another thing is, you see... You heard of the Luvowa Hospital Saga, I'm very sure, mm. where um, uh, too much money was given to an investor mm. through us. Mm. Through us, The same investor has been added land, has been added land recently mm. in the newspapers. I read the New Vision. And the same investor has not accounted for the funds he took last time, but he's getting tax holidays, he's getting uh, more mm. free land to, to, to invest and grow mm. the economy the economy at the cost of natives 
very many young people yesterday in daily monitor there was a story where a young mm. person a, a group of young people senior for dropouts had actually innovated an electronic car an mm. electronic car but they lacked space they lacked resources they lacked material to to, to, to grow their dream to grow their dream oh, yeah. so as a country we are closing our eyes to such innovative people and okay. opening up our eyes to what does not matter just one right. thing. Fair enough. Okay. Just one thing. I think what the other the point he makes is that we we, we seem to be spending this money in non-performing ventures. For yeah. example, that if, if this money is being spent in in, a, in an industry, for example, tourism or th that that brings returns, you would have a ripple effect. That money would accumulate back into the consolidated fund. Mm. But with this program, is that we are taking money, but this money does not come. Like he says. You have a lot youth livelihood program M yoga. You have a lot of people, youth who take this money and fail to return that money. So it means that industry in which government is putting this money does not return. Mm. So government that does not accumulate its revenue. Mm. It's more of an expenditure. Okay. It does it does not invest no in return. performing industries. Yeah. Oh, and, okay. and where Fair are enough. we getting this money? Are we escalating our debt burden? Mm. Because we are I told you we are adding another log on too much that Don't is know. overwhelming us. Okay, fair enough. We shall cross-examine where the money comes from slightly later. But let me bring in Christine. Christine, um, Comrade Sam, endeavoured to explain to us how this money will come. That from the government coffers straight into um, these circles. I want to believe that by now you have a ghetto youth circle that um, at least you shared with me off camera. But the concern is that... and colleagues have put it across that the, the, the level of financial literacy of our young people is still very wanting. That yes, government gives us this money and we fail to pay back. Why? Because when the money is given for us to invest in productive ventures, we instead go and maybe wed and you know, get married and go and you know, pay dowry. And before you know it, the money does not multiply and therefore you fail to pay government back its That's money. It, yeah. So at times it could be unfair to indict government and say government isn't doing enough. Yet we, the citizens, are not, you know, playing our part. We are not, you know, meeting our end of the bargain. So when we get this money, like Sam said, it is a revolving fund. Get it, invest it, then you pay back government so that other people can benefit. But it looks like our financial literacy, as we speak, more so of young people, is still very wanting. So don't you think that this money, when it comes, the 17 million or 30 million that is going to go to the young people, and these ghetto circles that have been established, won't they just get this money and just go and buy alcohol? Or is there some level of financial literacy and knowledge and, you know, investment plan that they have already set aside? Or it's just a gamble? That's very true. It's, uh, I will slightly concur with his word where he said that in the ghetto, that if someone is naked, at least he has to cover him or herself somewhere where it seems to be private. But this is the true story. Whether we like it or not, someone in the ghetto has never gotten a point to access government money. Mm -hmm. And in that point, we, are, we don't look at government money as very important because it is always very small. Mm. We also live by our own dream, though we are living in that environment. That environment doesn't mean that everyone who lives there is totally <laughs> nuisance. <laughs> no, we, we have businesses. Let, mm. me, let me say. Yeah, that's true. In a bus company, I work in a bus company. All, all mechanics, like you have studied in mechanics engineering as a topic, right? It's a... It's an engineering, engineering course, right? Mm. But I want to tell you the truth that someone in the ghetto can be a better engineer than you. He mm. can repair a, an engine and he can be even a practical teacher than you who has gone to school. But what is that boy like, like he said, that innovative programs? That's why I'm going to concur with him. That he's not innovated des despite of him coming up with the creativity done. He needs to be pushed to the another level. Mm. But... I work with the Minister of Trans I work with transport sector, whereby almost almost half of the ghetto boys are in the transport sector, where there are blockers, there are mechanics. You understand the sector side where all spare parts are being sold, where you guys you cannot go and do so. Mm. But that's that's money. 
He look at them and also come aside and concur with him where he said that taxes are very high. The, the burden goes to the low class person whereby he mm. pays the burden to the, to the investor who has come in, co leaving the consideration of the natives who are in, within the country. Mm. That's very true. But what do I say that this parish model, this parish development model stuff can be okay or not? If for me, it can be okay when the system has brought in awareness and financial discipline. But where it does not, where I don't concur with it is one, if there is no payback, it won't go on with anything because the government will not keep on picking money and feed people and spoon fed Ugandans. We like, like for us in the ghetto, we have circles. We have we give out money to the youths mm. and they are very responsible. Mm -hmm. Someone has a kid in good times, someone has a kid in very good schools than even people who are behind here. Mm. But you come and pick two million, three million, he says, uh, the government. No, mm. like right now. Mm. We'll pay it back. Mm -hmm. Give you three three months, we say please in every day we need this amount. Okay. We assess okay. depending on how you save. Mm. When you save, when you say you have a capacity of saving 40 million with us, 40,000 every day. When you come in alone, it's okay. His saving has been so reliable and we've been using his money mm. for renting others. So what do we do? We use that saving. We say, okay, according to this, 5 million is not bad for him for three months to be paid back. So we look at affordability. What do you afford mm -hmm. to pay back? Okay, um, just fair enough. Uh, that is a good question that um, I will throw to Sam later on. But let me first bring in Comrade Lowell. Lowell, you're a legal scholar. And one thing for sure that I know of is that the law defines how policies should, you know, should be created. I don't know if the Polish development model falls under the, the policy formulation process or it is an executive you know, decision or an executive initiative that may not exactly require the normal procedures of, um, of how to formulate a policy. But if it were to require that process of formulating a policy, then that is where the legal regime comes in. And that's where we would question that, was, was the process duly followed in coming up with the project movement model? Because I know that there must be public consultation, the public must be involved before government or before parliament enacts any policy. That is where now I'm, I'm torn in between, is this a policy or is it an executive initiative? But if it's a policy, then enable us unpack the legal background and the shortcomings that come with it but if it is an executive decision then maybe there is not so much to talk about I, I, yes it, 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 it's it's legal it, it has gone through the, the the process through which it should i think it was initiated by the ministry of finance local government uh, yeah, mm -hmm. i think ministry of finance okay yeah, yes yes but of, okay. of course for any it's going to be part of 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 the budget, it has to be uh, debated and and passed by the, by the budget by yeah. the by the parliament. It has yeah. to go through the budget committee, etc. So those those are fulfilled. I think no, because my concern and question is yeah. on the aspect of public involvement, pub public participation. Because I'm sure if the public was duly consulted, maybe the questions that you guys are putting up across here would not have been you know arising because you would have been involved and consulted, and your opinions yeah. would have been duly captured. So the aspect of public involvement, do you think we are still lacking? Public involvement, even if we were to do uh, right now and we move around and asking people if money should come to the village or to their border border stage, they would say yes. Mm. Uh, but that for me is not enough. For me, my, my, my major contention at least is, is on the feasibility of this. And, and like I've said, when you go to the ghetto, these individuals, have, do not feel the government in their everyday life. They, mm. they, they, everything is by their effort. When they get this chance for money to come to them, then it's, it's a good thing. Mm. Uh, I, was, I was following up in Karanga district, the yoga program. Mm. You know, it was more centers are government. It's money mm. from government. Mm. And, and mm. people think it's, some think it's NRA money. Mm. People think, you know, it's, it's their money to eat, right? Yes, so yes, yes. maybe, it, it, I don't think that the legalism is, 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 is an issue here. Mm. And, and that by the time this has to be debated and passed by the budget committee and this budget is approved by, by parliament, it has gone through due process. So meaning there is no much question around it, the There is no much framework. question around 
around there, especially that things like planning, at least a prerogative of of of, of, of the government of infrastructure the yes. mm. of, of the Ministry of Information and and like he has and like he has he has been involved largely, mm. uh, though he perhaps is under the Ministry of Gender and mm. Youth Affairs, it is. So mm. that involvement is there. Mm. But again, the government has the, the biggest stake in formulation of policy. Mm. So now that's when we get to debate. Is the government policy good or bad? Mm. But again, whether it's due process, I think yes, it is. Okay, sure, fair enough. I have something to add on that. Okay. Like uh, he, in 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 the due course development model, you see something. It's economical. Mm. It's transformation, transforming the livelihood of someone. It can't be personal, because when money is given to me, why should it remain to me alone? Yes, mm. sir. It should go back to the community mm. and then they give back to another person. another person. We are very many. We don't look at this population as today as 44 million people. We are still more than that. Mm. We look at our circle whereby when someone has a motorcycle, mm. you give a motorcycle to, to this one and you tell him a word that please, this motorcycle must gi be given to another person. Mm. What does it mean? This person is going to work hard to pay the motorcycle so that the another one can also go back and find it there. Mm. So with this model, it, we learn from the past. Mm. It's a very good program. Mm. Indeed, it's good yeah. among us, the youth. Mm. But the payback must be there. Sure. Because um, paying back mm. helps someone. It demands you. Mm. It demands you to say that you have taken what is not yours. Mm. What you are going to work out to get is yours. Mm. What you are giving back needs to go back to another person. Sure. It's yeah. a collective responsibility, so we need to pay back and say others must also must benefit, benefit from it. It's sure. a rotational responsibility. Fair enough. Let me just bring in Sam. Sam, let me just continue. Uh, Solomon, I see your hand is up, but let me come to you shortly. Mm -hmm. Let's first pick the financial uh, perspective of this conversation. And Sam, you've heard what um, Comrade Christine is saying, that they need to pay back. Mm -hmm. And I think that is where pillar number five becomes very important, the mindset and, you know, training people to appreciate that this money is not your money. Mm -hmm. Just use it, but then, you know, ensure that you repay it back. Mm -hmm. But also the political concern that Lowell brought about earlier on, mm -hmm. saying that many Ugandans see this as, you know, NRM giving back to them that, okay, thank you for voting us. Now this is your reward. Mm -hmm. So they don't see the need to repay because the, the mindset is that yeah, this is good. our payback. You know, Museveni, uh, President Museveni is paying us for voting, <laughs> so therefore there is no need to repay. So the issue of mindset, I, I, I think so much work needs to be yeah, done around that. They need that. to get political scores. Hmm? They need to get political scores by those who take the money. They want to make it seem like they have done something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I do agree with you that uh, the issue of mindset is a, is a bigger issue. Actually, when you look at uh, among the pillars, besides the 100 million, if I was supposed to invest, I would actually invest um, a certain percent of that money towards the mind to change. Because that's like, it hunkers, it, it, it's what's going to drive the sustainability of the program within the community. But also it is very unfortunate, to some excess yes, uh, the way our government do their things. I was very surprised when I saw the budget circular, the second call for the budget circular. Uh, of course, Minister of Gender is the one is in charge of handling this mindset change and community mobilizations and all that. Instead of Minister of Finance giving Minister of Gender more money so that they can go to the community and sensitize the community about the program, they only decided to allocate one billion. What can one billion do to, uh, to sensitize the 44 million population hmm, in the country? I think it is very small and uh, that's also, also bring I think, it. Isn't that what Solomon was trying to say? Mm. That then now that's also bringing Because us our to... coffers are small, mm. and therefore, if we we have two options either to inject in little money to the community or we go and borrow. Mm. So, which is uh, the, the, the better option? I think it's it rather mm. use, use the, the small you have rather it's... than incurring <laughs> debt. You see, I, 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 I can never accept an argument that government doesn't have money. The role of a state is to mobilize resources mm. to support its own development. Mm. And that is the core mandate, besides protection of all whatever government does need money. Yeah. So if the program is their priorities and that particular pillar of mindset change, they have acknowledged that it is important, 
then there's no problem with the state prioritizing it and spending more money in that yeah. besides other expenditures because we have seen emergencies coming up and money is being put into it mm. but at the end of the day this is a program that's supposed to go to the community and we are looking at the sustainability and economic impact mm. of but that particular activity, that's the parish development model to the community, to our citizens, mm. uh, something that is going to take money to them and cushion them and bring them up to, instead of yeah. focusing on, on food, to, food to mouth, mm. uh, is focusing on the commercial aspects, they're selling, they're feeling like at least I can now do something. The money economy. Yeah, so that, that's, that's where the problem is. But also I want to, to, I would encourage government to invest more money in that. One billion is too small. Even an institution that NYC is cannot run its activity only within one billion in a financial year. Yeah. So I think going forward, I think government should do that. We need to invest more huh? because mm -hmm. literally mindset, mindset issue is a bigger issue mm -hmm. in this country. And most importantly, to the young people that mm -hmm. we lead. Hmm? Yeah. You have already noticed that they are saying that money, government money. Hmm? Mm -hmm. The same thing happened with Emioga. Emioga came in, people said that. Government is going to give us a million. Mm -hmm. eh, the IPA group, that's what it was. But then it was changed into a constituency and all new mechanism brought up and you acknowledge that mm. young people did, has not all that benefited out of this because at the end of the day we studied and found out that it is a program Sam, benefiting yeah. one. My, my last question to you, Sam, mm. is that in all honesty, do you think as the NRM mm. we have, or you have had mm. time to cross-examine the previous programs and assess why they failed mm. and therefore you're sure that you will not make the same mistakes on the parish development model mm. because like you've put it across here that you know the the Mioga came as 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 maybe a district fund then then it went to constituency i mean mm. it looks like we launched it prematurely mm. a Mioga. that is why along the way we now began to change approach okay mm. is it constituency is it so mm. it, it it looks like it was a premature you know uh launch but how sure can Ugandans and the young people that, that you lead have the guarantee that government will not make the same mistakes that it made this time and that the project development model will be a much more organized and much more well implemented program? So your assurance, then I will pick uh, your last words on this particular topic mm -hmm. in just one minute. Yeah. So your last words, yeah. yeah. Maybe before I go into assurance, uh, my sister was saying that um, this money needs to be revolving. It's true it's a revolving fund. Although the revolving has to be within the group, mm. just like the circle you operate within the ghetto, people have to pay back. So it's upon the group leadership hmm, to, divide, to, to design mechanisms of how the money should be paid back once they have accessed it. Because the money is entitled to remain within the parish, not to be returned back. Maybe government will get it through tax, mm. eh? um, things like uh, services that they will be rendering. So it's a revolving fund. Mm. So uh, the effectiveness of how it Return to the to, to to the group depends on the how group how the group is organized. Mm -hmm. So literally, the, the the responsibility is entirely within the community. Mm -hmm. That's why also it, it's still allowed to the the issue of the mindset. If the group has the wrong mindset, then the money will disappear. Mm -hmm. If the group has people with the right mindset, then they will actually sustainably what mm -hmm. prosper. And then of course, uh, going through the experience of other programs, I think um, government is doing much. Hmm? But uh, uh, to us, the citizens, sometimes maybe we are not all that doing our part. Eh? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we need to, first of all, embrace. Eh? And then also know that the difference between these programs, uh, the, the other programs that have come in, of course, to me, the programs that have been so far implemented by government that I feel like it has actually tried to succeed towards supporting the young people is the youth library program. I can, because there you can point people who have benefited and all that, and you know that even if you go to your sub county right now, you you know that there's a group somewhere here that were given something or they benefited, whether they're given finances or they're given goods or that or border borders, yeah. But um, I think it's come to the commitment and um, of, of 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 us the citizens and uh, the leaders. Mm. to first of all sensitize our colleagues and um, where there's challenges let it be a collective responsibility Maybe, Sam, just one second mm. because you've attached some success to the youth level program mm. and the one thing i know about the youth level program and you'll correct me if i'm wrong is that it was being administered by centenary bank mm. or that is the youth capital venture fund that is the youth capital, capital ventures fund okay then there my question becomes immaterial yeah but um if you're done 
Mm. Then I, I would love to pick our final remarks just mm. in one minute yeah. regarding the parish development model mm. and how best you think government should implement this. Yeah. I think so, I'm done. Y y you're done? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Now we'll first, then I will go to you, Sam, again, Comrade Solomon, then I will conclude with uh, Christine. <clears throat> yes. Um, in conclusion, I think if it's not just for, you know, political scores, for what just few government in their pockets that I got something. Mm. Uh, we need to look into how we can sustainably sustain our economy. I think that we, we as I think generally my prescription would be that we must accept to do bad in the short run for the sake of accumulating more revenue in the long run. Mm. We should have policies that protect local uh, small scale businesses. We should have these tax holidays for the youth started small scale industries as opposed to having these um, is tax incentives at the top where you have big multinational companies coming from out operating on these uh, tax holidays at the expense of the local ones. Again, we need to protect our, our local businesses for them to exist. Mm. I do not think that capital is, is the biggest challenge. Mm. I, I, and, and I also think that government has, Uganda is a perfect example in the world of our, this model that has failed, mm. we should not continue to invest money in a non-performing project if we want to you know, accumulate revenue at the end of that day. Because the return of this money on all these programs has been very low. Uh, that, that's what I can right. say. I think the model is flawed. Thank yeah. you. Fair enough. Sam, your last words? Yeah, uh, I think my last word is that we live in a country that is one of the youngest in Africa. When you look at our average After age, it's yes. around 15.8, mm. 9. If you run it, over 16. Yeah. So that's the average population. And as young people, we have a responsibility mm. to shape the agenda of this country and also to ensure that um, we empower mm? Mm. within among us ourselves and also to encourage our colleagues. Uh, the program has come and it's benefiting 60% of people within our age group. And our role now should be to encourage our young people to take up this positively, talk to them and guide them. And where are the mistakes? I think there's an open door policies. We have the institution like the National Youth Council. We have the ministry, like the Ministry of Gender, if you are not able, but we have youth leadership at all levels. We try to, as she said, act collectively as young people and address the challenges that is existing. What I can assure uh, the viewers and the public is that with the parish development model, the information is going to go as deep as to the local person. It's rather you make a mistake while knowing that it's a mistake, not other than making a mistake that you don't yes, know. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the only thing I can say. But yes. let's embrace the program, let's support the initiative, yeah. and let's not look at the, the pillars of the financial inclusion. There are seven pillars, yeah. and all these attach importance to the community. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you. I, I'm glad that you brought in the aspect of uh, the doctrine of effective communication. Mm -hmm. You know, someone should not make a mistake subconsciously they should make a mistake and well knowing that you know it was intentional um solomon your last words um you see um Chideka, in academia you thrive on criticism so I, I i actually expect my brother my brothers on the other side of the nrm not to um take us as bad mouthing government projects but criticizing them and positive criticism for the betterment of this country then, um, as, I, as I conclude, I want to take it from now when you asked a question on whether um, this policy had a legal inclination. It is true, it had a legal inclination. And these are some of the debates we had on the floor of Parliament. Uh, Matthias Mpuga raises a point, um, followed by Mwanga Chivumbi, when the minister gave his statement on the parish module, development module on the legal on, on, on the legal baseline study of the program initiative which has not been answered up to date therefore it leaves us in suspense under what locus are we going to be implementing such a robust program that is going to cover the entire nation and with a very big dreams i am afraid the plane might crash <laughs> thank you yes uh Kristen, your last words thank you very much for my case the parish development model is very okay. 
it's much okay. But the system and the implementation mm. may not be okay. If the system is easier for a local person to access, is okay. But if it's not going to be easier, it undergoes a system of assessment. Mm -hmm. Bureaucracy. It's not there. One, it must be an open. It must. Be, first of all, if we are not aware, there's no way the system is going. Awareness to mm. the youths. The youths are not aware. The world where I am is there are many youths, very many and many are, are educated and uneducated. They are operating under informal life or settlements. But if awareness is in their hands, they will come into the program and make this event go on. But there is no awareness of PDM. PDM came in, it's now coming to five months when I had a PDM, parish model, parish model, before the launch mm. on 26th at Chiboko. But still, when the president launches, he said it, that the, everyone looks at it at, as NRM money. Even us down there, we, that's why we don't look at it, because when you go to access it, it might be under NRM money, no. But it might be undergoing a sector of which there is favorism, mm. there, is, there is who, son of who, or daughter of who. But if the system is promoting equality, which I'm not uh, sure of Uganda at the moment, it must not go on. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I love Let, the way you conclude because yes. you're very neutral, you're very mm. objective. Yes. Part of you agrees with the other half, part of yes. you is saying you no. Know, and I, I, I think that's how we should you know, advance our arguments mm -hmm. from an objective point of view. Uh, to our viewers, now we are shifting gears to the next 10 or 7 minutes of this conversation where we shall just speak your opinions around uh, digital rights in Uganda. And to begin straight away, Lawel, let me start with you, still from the legal perspective. Um, just give us a snippet about the digital or technology legal framework in Uganda. Mm. I know that for sure we have a Computer Misuse Act, you know, I know we have a privacy, you know, D Data Privacy Act in Uganda. I, I, there is a whole legal regime which shows that the government is taking steps towards, you know, establishing a strong legal framework, which of course forms the background for any, um, you know, uh, sector, to, sector to thrive. So just kick us off about digital rights in Uganda. Yes, yes. I, I think that, that as the world has evolved, uh, there is this new space, there's a lot of technological advancement, there is this widening world where, that, where everything is taking place. But we are not sure that the law has also been as, as fluid as to cope up with this new technological development. So you have a lot of gaps in terms of the law covering these spaces, uh, you know, to what extent the privacy of the user, to what extent can, can the, the service providers, the, the Google ETC can access your private information, other users, to what extent can government, you know, uh, follow up on what you do with your smartphone. For example, there are the, the, the areas which are regulated by law that, for example, my communication, if I'm a patient and I'm, I'm communicating with my doctor or, you know, a client, lawyer, uh, uh, arrangement that these are supposed to be confidential. But to what extent does the CID or the body in charge of investigation get to access my information, uh, who I talk to, right? So you realize that these gaps are not very, th those, there are very many gaps and that, that the law must also cope up with these, these new questions that arise as a result of technological, uh, technological advancement That's and it. use of the internet. Uh, but I think me, what I want to interest myself is the idea of the freedom of speech and the Computer Misuse Act. I think it is important that people do not, uh, you know, abuse their freedoms of speeches and expressions, etc. Because your right is, is you have as as much as you have a right to these things, you also have an obligation to another person, or mm. government has an obligation to protect another person's enjoyment of those rights. But I'm afraid we should be careful. You know, to what extent do we regulate speech? I think in a democratic setting. We must be as careful as possible not to regulate how people must express themselves because democracy thrives around that. And, and, and the law cannot be such that we regulate to the extent that we do not want, we, we regulate things we, we just are not comfortable with. Mm. 
the, the idea of freedom of speech will be that you are willing to as much as possible be tolerant another because if that was not the case then there wouldn't be need to guarantee these freedoms right so i think as much as people must regulate have these regulations in a democratic setting we risk to uh, limit people's freedoms by 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 you know emphasize uh, over being restrictive people should be able to express themselves to say things that people in offices don't want to hear even if they are being abusive we must tolerate people's opinions as much as possible even if they're being abusive <laughs> in terms, for, for example I, I think we must because for example how, to what extent do i find you know what for example kakwenza or uh, my friend stella uh, you know what we classify as immoral to what extent mm. can we for sure draw a line on what can be said and what cannot be so for us to avoid that we must be able to as much as possible deregulate the, the freedom of expression that extent even when we don't like what they say we, okay. they should be able to say it at least okay but clearly we know that uh, freedom of speech is not exactly under the non-derogable rights. Y yes, you know, it, we yes. know of habeas corpus, <laughs> we know of all those things. Look, but, at, look at it this But way. fair enough, let me just bring no, but, in... Okay, something small. Okay. That, that we may not necessarily have laws on, on, like, on cyber or, or use of internet. There are laws, there are other laws which, for example, bar hate speech, inciting particular tribes over others. Mm. You, you get, those laws already exist in our setup. Mm. What we are... What, but the problem we are going into is to regulate even these normal spaces that we have, and at that extent, we risk, um, you know, sh uh, you know, okay. uh, uh, shrinking the democratic space. Fair enough, comrade Sam. Mm. You've heard Lawel. He has no kind words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is your own perspective? Uh, my own perspective when they come to the issue of freedom of speech is that um, it's related to our morals mm. and our and characters. Um, Lawrence, when you are raised up in a, a family where they don't tolerate the use of abusive words, I am very sure if I, even if I know you, you will not abuse me. You will find another alternative in a respectful way to address the grievance between me and you. So, um, so that's literally to me it point out that uh, the use of abusive words is not something that we need to regulate. We just need to check on our our morals eh? and how we are brought up, eh? um, and also how what is you need to be very objective and very careful on the kind of people we talk to because it's all still the people who are raised up. Me, I could be tolerable. You can abuse me, and I'll it, I'll feel the pain, but at the end of this, I'll calm down. But the people who are, grew up, they have never been abused, or they're very negative towards abusive language. Mm. So we need to be, so it's just about the concept of who you are as mm. a person. And um, I've seen a lot of laws, we have the laws that govern all that, but um, with the recent one in Seriko is going to bring in parliament. I feel like it's not necessary that we should have new laws to govern this. You talked about the Computer Misuse Act. We talked about the, the data privacy and all those. Uh, the, the laws are there in place. Eh? But um, we just need to check on our morals as an individual and as a family and the kind of the generation we want to have. Mm. So to me, I would not at all rate abusive words to be used in public spaces mm. because literally I'm going to encourage other people who are not used to that to start doing the same, mm. uh, which is not good for the kind of future we want, the kind of community we want to, 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 to see in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sam, uh, thank you very much. Solomon and Christine, I want to be uh, uh, very deliberate on time. And you have one minute, and then Christine will give us well, the last word. Well, I'll take it from now. There are majorly two principles of natural justice. Justice must be seen to be done and not say to be done. And the other one is, he who alleges cannot be judged in his own case. What we are seeing in Uganda today is uh, an assumption of excessive power to manipulate the laws to suit the interests of the state. First and foremost, um, I should note that um, it is okay for me to say you're stupid, for me to say you're ugly for me to say that um, I don't like this because it is my opinion. And 
when you go into when you go into literature, when you go into arts, there is what we call symbolism, allegory, and the art of communication. However, this is not reconciled with our laws, with our laws. So it is imperative upon us to appreciate the purpose of the law. If I have offended you with my language, because we must actually accept that um, the law provides for all actions. You have two options. You can either bring up a civil suit against me. A criminal. Through a tortious, mm. through a tort. A tort, yeah. yeah. Or a tortious liability or a criminal offense, offense, which in most cases I think the state has been manipulating the laws in place. You can see Dr. Stella Nyanz was acquainted in, 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 in the high court because she had no complainant. However much criminal law is for the purpose of the public, the public interest, yeah. there must be an interested party mm. as a complainant. So, not just the state. Not just the state. Mm. So without a complainant, a file cannot go any further. Okay. Any further. However, I would also love to make this very important, that we are moving into digitalization. Coronavirus, I'm so happy that it came at a certain extent, however much so disappointed and hurt at a certain point, that coronavirus exposed the um, developments into the digital world. Digitalization is playing a fundamental role in social, political, and economic transformation of the world. Of the world. So I think as we think on limitations, as we think on criticizing the, uh, the right to digital access or digitalization, mm -hmm. we need to be um, up to speed on the importance of digitalization of the various sectors. Fair enough. Christian, one minute. Thank you very much. To me, it's not a problem, like you said, that for his talked of freedom of that. You know, when there is freedom, everyone expresses of himself the way he lives. Because there are people who are not who are born of parents and they have not been mentored by parents. They have True. mentored themselves. True. So we have a role to play. If you have and there are many who are existing in that life. Mm -hmm. So when one time he wakes up and he becomes better and he can use misuse of the computer, like you said, That's you shouldn't true. blame that person so much. But at the same time, let us have what you call flexibility and objectiveness in every point that we take off in life. If we are flexible on how the matter can be handled, because the law is there, and we, ne we shall never work without the law. But stepping on the law must also be there because not it's only one president in Uganda and the decision is not even within us, not within the legal people whom we say the judge can make the decision. Because we have seen so many people coming in and go out within a second and say it's not around and it comes back. So the whole thing comes into, we have to be very objective on this. The world has grown up, advancements are coming in. We have to accept to go on. With or without, you have to go on with the technology to advance. Because when you go to the world technology, we look at developed countries, most of the developed countries, we just need to implement the awareness amongst the people that it's not right to do this. And when you teach them, the government is, the digital world came in, but we lacked awareness. Mm. So we went into, a, let's say, nervousness and excitement that we just entered in. I remember in 1999, that's when we started seeing the phones, what, what, in Uganda here. But when you look at the system, when it came in, nobody taught us. Mm. And when you look at, my sister was in USA when they started the first phone, they were in class being taught how to use and how to implement the phone. So all the systems that are in Uganda, they are not, they are, there's no any awareness among the population. Yeah. We bring it, maybe if there's an awareness of the few, you make it a course unit, the study, and a few comes in to implement. Okay, fair enough. That is, I guess, a recommendation to our education sector. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that by all means brings us to the end of this particular episode of the Youth Roundtable. To the panelists, thank you very much, Comrade Solomon, Comrade Sam, Comrade Christine, and Comrade Lowell. Thank you for sparing the time to be with us in this conversation. We highly appreciate it. To the technical team, it's always a pleasure to have you bring to our viewers this show on time. My last words on the show are the words of Thomas Hobbes, who one time said that the state and the people must have a relationship because they both need one another for the sustainable development of any country. Thank you very much. Until next week, see you.